So let's, let's start with that, ladies. I remember when I first started Entrepreneur Week back in uh, 2009, I ran a panel called Women in Tech, and the same exact thing happened. Is the room was packed. It was 600 students in an NYU auditorium, and three-fourths of them left, just like what's happening now. Who has a comment on why that's happening? Mike's right there. Um, for everybody that's walking out right now, this is a human issue. It's not just a women's issue. Okay? Um, the way that we make change happen, and it is important to have the presence of women in tech and in every industry, the way that we have change happen is that the majority, the white guys, need to say that there is a problem. And if some of you stick around, you can hear why we all strongly believe that um, the way to build a better business is to have many different influences, to have much diversity in how you build things. And I can tell you, if you are looking for VC, um, they're going to want to see diversity within your company and within the leadership. So um, I think this is happening because people are walking out who think it doesn't apply to them, but it affects everybody. Okay, people, you are the ones on the back. Um, if you are thinking about doing your own company, then in, you don't understand that most of the purchasing decisions have done by women, you're most likely to fail. So you better come back and listen to us, us who are managing most of the money in any family, us who are using all your devices and gadgets. So go ahead and build those without us, and you will see how much money will spend on your products and services. You can also come from a different point of view. When you have a diverse team, you have people with different experiences, and these people are, have knowledge in different areas. Statistically, if you have a B team with a wide range of experience, they're actually going to be able to solve a problem, a more complicated problem, than an A team that all has the exact same experience. You could have the most amazing team that all went to MIT, they will get stuck in the exact same place and they will not be able to come up with a solution. This has actually been proven statistically through academic research. So if you want to have your problem solved, if you want to move forward and make more money, Companies with women on the board make an average of 24% more in, uh, in profit than companies without. Mm -hmm. So this is about money at the end of the day. Paying attention means you make more. So in answer to uh, Peter's question is why do, we, why, why, do, why do I think that the people are leaving uh, and not thinking this is important? And I think one of the big reasons is that the, the style of women, people don't perceive as strong leadership. So for example, when Angela Merkel became um, you know, prime minister of, of uh, Germany, a lot of people were, were making comments that, oh, Angela, oh, she's such a weak leader, she, you know, because she didn't stand up in the macho style and go, boom, 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 yo, we're gonna do this, right? She actually was very, very collaborative. And she tried to get people consensus to do it. But people didn't perceive her style as a strong leadership style. But guess what? History has proven itself. Is which is the strongest country in the EU right now? It's Germany. And that was done under Angela Merkel's leadership. There's been a lot of problems through the EU among several country, you know, countries like Greece, Ireland, even Spain. And it's been Germany that's been saving the EU. And under whose leadership? It was under a female leadership, even though her style wasn't perceived to be a strong leader. So I think there's a big issue with perception of the way women talk, manage, as not being strong leaders. And I think that's a, a you know, huge reason for this. Well, let's go down the row and talk a little bit more about that and, and elaborate on that in terms of what are some of the things that, that 
can be done in, in that respect that aren't being done or change the paradigm of a guy like myself is just a plain white guy normally. Luckily, I sit on the global board of Astia. If anybody, has anybody ever heard of Astia before in Silicon Valley? A-S-T-I-A. Check it out. It's the most successful nonprofit in the world for promoting high growth women entrepreneurs. So check it out. <laughs> Nothing specific? Okay. I think um, one of the things we kind of talked about, and Gigi came to me and said, asked me, why do we want in, to have more women in technology and science? And I was thinking, why? So one of the answers could be, and again, talking from Silicon Valley point of view, well, we need engineers, we need programmers, period. We run out of male ones, so we need to have more uh, labor. We need to have more skilled uh, programmers and engineers. And um, I think women who um, have those skills, and I'm not saying that every single women can be successful in technology, but the ones that really have those skills, they should, shouldn't be shying away from those jobs. Um, and I think our role as women entrepreneurs who have been in leadership roles uh, in different companies, we need to uh, mentor more of the uh, young women in colleges, because uh, probably it's too late if they didn't get uh, you know, education even from high school, and mentor them into the roles where they can be successful as women in science and technology. And talk a little bit about your backgrounds as well, because we skipped that part, and we'll go down the line. We, 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 we got right into the topic, and nobody knows exactly each of our backgrounds, so let's, let's get into that too, All right. please. I guess I'll start it. Um, my name is Shira Abel. I'm the CEO of Hunter and Bard. We're an international marketing agency. We work with companies all the way from Russia, Germany, France, US, Israel. We're based in Israel. Okay. We've got partners in the US and in Israel. Um, just a few things about me which might be relevant is um, English is my third language. I was actually born in Taiwan and I learned Taiwanese and then my mother taught me Mandarin. And so it wasn't until I went to school in the US that I finally learned English. So, um, so language should not be a problem. And I'm an engineer by training, believe it or not, mechanical engineer and got into being, got, I started working for some startups and got caught by the startup bug and ever since then I've been through seven startups and I would never go back. There you go. I think I was born as a geek. Um, so I was born in Azerbaijan and I grew up in Baku and um, for the most of my life I was professional chess player, um, playing with a team like with Kasparov was quite good, so I'm like official geek. But I had the other side of me. I was geek in nice dress and with makeup and with uh, all the other things that normally people don't picture geeks being, you know, that. So anyways, uh, naturally I um, I became an engineer, so I was a programmer, and um, I came to the United States in 90 and immediately found a job as a programmer and moved on and was um, at one of the highest technical roles at Pricewaterhouse, managing huge engagements and teams of developers like of 80 people. Um, so, you know, as gig, as technical you could be. And uh, then I decided to move and start doing startups uh, in 2000, before crash. Uh, timing was perfect. 
And since uh, 2000, I was in VP of sales, marketing, biz dev, and CEO role, and advisor role, uh, board members of different startups. And now I'm the founder and CEO of my own startup, and you will hear more about it tomorrow. Hi, I'm Kate Ertman. Um, I spoke a little earlier today that, um, so some of you heard that I own a 3D animation company back in the States. Um, I've been running it for 15 years, so that means that I got in to 3D and animation right at the very beginning of what 3D is and kind of sort of was, and it's changing every day. Um, but my background comes from being in front of the camera and acting and wanting to know how the stuff was done on the other side of the camera. And once I learned how to produce and work with um, a lot of different types of people, I started becoming fascinated with one of the tools that people were using in film and in video and the internet in the 90s, which was uh, computer graphics. And once I learned that there was a lot of math and science involved with that, I got even more excited. So that is kind of how I think I ended up straddling this strange world between creative and uh, technology and um, being relatively successful at um, maintaining my company and being a leader who knows uh, that collaborative part that a lot of times that women will bring to leadership as well as understanding the um, hardcore technology part of it. Hi, my name is Marianne Paulsen. I'm Danish, live in Germany. Uh, spent four years in Silicon Valley building uh, Innovation Center Denmark for the Danish government. Uh, have had five successful startups. Uh, is on my sixth one right now. And on top of that, I represent uh, Stanford Research Institute, SRI International, in Northern Europe. What we do is we actually try to help researchers understand how to drive research out of the lab and how to commercialize their knowledge. And what I see in countries like, well, all around the Baltic region, is that the majority of researchers today are actually women, but the majority of people that want to actually go into the game of creating a startup out of their knowledge are men. So I'm trying to change that uh, one team at a time. Uh, and I, well, we can get back to why I think that is happening. I have a question. So, Peter, why are you here on stage with us? <laughs> why do you think this topic is important? Well, if my name was Peter, that would be one thing. <laughs> but, um, frankly, the reason I'm on this stage, um, I have a very blunt history in fighting against the glass ceiling and fighting ag against the good old boys club. You can Google Gary Whitehill and type in women and I come right up. Um, in particular, in an article with my mother um, done in Amex Open Forum. And the reason why is because when I was growing up, uh, I grew up with a mother who made four times as much as my father and I saw the way in which my mother was treated in the insurance industry in the early 80s, in the late 80s, in the early 90s, being the first woman director in Travelers, and her now being one of the top humans in the world at insurance, having spent years and years on the IT side and also on the business side. And she could be the CEO of any one of the insurance firms that anybody in this room could think of, and the only reason she's not, for a fact, is because she's a woman and she's been passed up for every major position you could think of in the insurance industry because she is a woman. Um, what's interesting is when you take her skill set and you apply it in other industries, uh, she went into the renewable space for a while in some of these other industries, she was treated just like anybody else, but because she was in one of these male-dominated, downtrodden industries, um, it, it was very clear. And, and to be honest with you, when it really hit my mom was in the dot-com days when she realized that she was getting paid half as much as a male co-worker next to her. And that's when she quit her jobs at Travelers Insurance and went to a venture-backed startup that was funded by Dearborn Partners in Michigan. And then from there, her salary quadrupled in the matter of two years. You know, there's a bit of... Um 
interesting anecdote that happened recently is I, about two weeks ago, I met the, the chairman of IBM uh, in Europe. Uh, his name's Harry. I forget his last name. I'm not very good with names, can you tell? <laughs> Anyways, um, last year, IBM installed as their first, a fir their first woman CEO. Her name is Ginny. And um, I talked to Harry, because he's you know, one of the most senior people in IBM. And I asked him, I said, Harry, is it different having a woman as a CEO? I mean, is there a difference between having, you know, a male CEO versus a female CEO? And he's, and I was very curious to hear his answer because he was one of the people who was being considered for CEO. And he didn't get it, but Ginny did. And he said, he, it's been great. It's just been great. And, I, and, and he told me for two reasons, or here are some examples, is that she has created a huge sense of collaboration in the company. An example he gave is every year, all the senior executives go to an um, executive conference for two days. I think it's Ireland or something. And in the past, they came and everyone gave presentations, presentation after presentation for two days. So this year, when she was CEO, they went there, they gave the usual presentations the first day, but there was no agenda for the second day. And everyone's all upset, like, what are we going to do tomorrow? What's the agenda? Do I have to present? Do I have to say something? And so they were all very nervous. They went into the second day of the executive meetings, and she said, listen, no presentations today. We only get together once a year, because we're in all different regions of the world. I want you guys all to talk, to talk to at least five people for an hour today. Now start talking. And so they spent the day talking with each other, sharing ideas. And Harry said that was the most productive executive leadership event meeting that he's had since he joined IBM. So that's an example of why it's, you know, where, where there's value when women are leaders. And IBM is one of the largest companies in the world. And they've got, you know, they, you know the executives there actually, you know, see the change and see the benefits. Yeah, let's hear some more examples from each, everybody on the panel of examples. I was thinking about this issue of women entrepreneurs, for example, for a while. And um, uh, this year uh, will be the fourth year me producing TEDx Bay Area Global Women Entrepreneurs event. And um, every year I was trying to bring different aspects of women entrepreneurial things into the event. And when, while I was doing that, I was contacted by my friends in Moscow who said, we really want to create this movement of women entrepreneurs in Russia. What and how we can, where, we, where can we start? And I was thinking about the whole life cycle on how this women entrepreneurial movement can uh, be developed. You know, it's like big fives, you always need to have methodology and life cycles. So my thinking was that it starts from the stage zero, and that stage is inspire. So taking that thought, we decided to produce an event in Moscow, and it will be a two-day conference for women entrepreneurs. We decided to bring different types of entrepreneurs and VCs from Silicon Valley, find those few in Russia. We didn't know what it will be. So two years ago, we had this hugely successful two days women, startup Women Russia conference in Moscow. Fast forwarding to today, they did an amazing job with lining up hundreds of women entrepreneurs in Moscow and Russia. They have weekly events, they have uh, the whole support network, mentors, uh, uh, 
amazing. So I think it's doable as long as we all understand that nothing happens overnight. And th there are certain stages that you need to go through. And I encourage all of you to think about how you can go from inspire to development to empower and actually seeing more of women entrepreneurs and engage us. We will be willing to help you, but we can talk all day long until we start actually doing things that will encourage the whole movement. So one of the things that comes up when, um, like today when I said I was going to speak on this panel, people will say, well, if women want to work in tech, why don't they just work in tech? Why, um, you know, I, I put out a job notice or I say I'm going to do a conference that'll be tech focused. And well, the women just don't show up. They don't apply for the jobs. Or if I put out a notice saying that I want to have someone speak at a conference and it's tech based, the women don't apply. Here's the unfortunate fact. You have to, if you want women to participate, because we don't have these examples to look up to as much as the guys do of leadership and of successful women, but you realize the importance of having that different perspective at your conference, in your company, you need to do more work to reach out and get those women, to get other minorities to participate in the whole equation that you're, that you're doing, be it a conference, be it a company. Um, so many times uh, if, if a woman is asked to do something, and I'm certainly talking in general here, but I am talking from my own knowledge of fact that um, there's, there's a sense of not wanting to fail because if you fail, if you go up on stage and you believe that you're not going to be able to speak intelligently about something, um, that your failure will be looked at as, well, see, we had a woman there and they will say that that whole demographic, she failed the demographic. Whereas if a guy fails, and as we talked a lot about today, that it's good to fail, that's how you learn. It's so rare, and I don't believe I've ever heard it, where if a guy fails, we say, oh, well, there's, there's those guys again, they're failing. That's why I don't have them at my conference, that's why I don't have them in my company. So there's that great fear because we don't have that example, and I encourage all of you to please understand that these other perspectives are so important in all the work that you do. So. Um, take that extra, it's going to be harder to find the people, to find the women, to find other minorities to participate, but it is so very important in the end for your company, for your conference, or your class, or your team, whatever it might be. I just refuse to be looked at as a minority. I'm a goddamn capable, smart woman that can do anything I set my mind to. So you girls out there, women, you know, don't think about yourself as a minority. You know, work with, work with people that inspire you, women and men. And you know, collaboration is really best if, if, if there's diversity on a team. So don't go into the other end of the spectrum and just do like total female teams. I don't believe that's diversity either. You know, just believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. I broke, I'm 61 years old, I've broken so many barriers in my life. And it's just, a, it's just a question of setting your mind to it and believing that you can do it. You know, and understand that men, at least in my generation, when I got my first job back in 75, they hired based on the tupo, hupo and lupo principle. They only hired someone that looked like themselves. So, you know, a blonde girl from Denmark, I mean, come on, and you want to be a McKinsey consultant? Yeah, try again. But I made it. I became the first female McKinsey consultant in Europe. So, you know, that was a big success to me, and I, you know, just made me believe that I can do anything I put my mind to. So start believing in yourself. That's where it all starts. What's, to follow up on that, and we'll go around, what's the number one thing in your journey that you've learned as a byproduct? Well, not, not only, I'm, I'm, I'm a single mom, I've been a single mom for 32 years, he's 34 now, he moved away from home many years ago. But I've started companies being a single mom. You know, that's a double minority. So if I started looking at myself as a minority, I would have been a social case 30 years ago, you know. 
that's not the spot I want to be in. So I have been my, my biggest strength. I mean, I, I used to write things on my, on my mirror, you know, like affirmations, like you can do it, you know, you're strong, you're smart, you, you know, you're, you're smarter than all the other guys. I mean, you know, you can get that job. So I, I just never accepted any barriers, never. Plus, I kept being curious. I'm 61, I'm on the board of five startups. I have sweat equity in a couple of startups. I learn new things every day. So just never lean back and think that you know it all. That's been my mantra. I love it. So, uh, Gigi. So, you know, it, I mean, we're up here and, you know, we're speaking here. We fly around the world. We, we see, you know, it's, you might think, oh, you guys, you're naturally that way. You're, you're naturally entrepreneurs, you're naturally successful. But it wasn't easy getting here, it, you, know, it, you know. Going back to high school, I was in advanced chemistry class, and my mom would recently told me that I told her that I wanted to fail my exams so I would have a lower grade so the boys would go out with me. <laughs> and, you know, those, those are some of the, like society challenges that you have to, you know, that women have had to deal with. And, you know, here's just some tips, uh, ideas to be better. Believe it or not, I used to be, I, the teachers used to complain that I didn't talk enough. <laughs> now look at me. So, <laughs> oh, don't laugh so hard. <laughs> Anyways, so um, when, when I was fresh out of college, I was a mechanical engineer, I went to work for Exxon. So talk about working for a big male-dominated company. I was a refinery engineer. I wore a hard hat, I wore coveralls, and I climbed up and down reactors. And one of the things that Exxon was very good about was about professional development. So they gave us a budget to go to a classes that we wanted to go to. And I went to a two-day seminar called uh, Image and Self-Projection for Professional Women. And it was great. It just taught, it taught me a lot about, you know, how to present yourself, how you might be perceived. And one of the things they talked about is that in society, especially in the workplace, there's sometimes there's some subtle, subtle ways of discrimination that aren't obvious. Like when I worked for um, a large company, uh, Quaker Oats, okay, the uh, manager, he, he wouldn't give me the good projects. And I said to him, why didn't you give me that project? And he said, oh, I was just trying to protect you. I didn't want to set you up for failure. And I, and I, that's subtle discrimination because if you don't get the good projects, you don't get to shine, you don't, people don't get to see how good you are, and then you don't get the promotions. So fight for your stuff. You have to go out and ask for it. Don't sit there and wait for it to be given to you because many cases you find out, I find out, that the people who got the opportunities asked for it. They weren't given those opportunities. So you have to go out and get it. And it's OK to ask. That's unlike what your parents told you. <laughs> we'll go right down the line. Go ahead. Go ahead. I actually want to say two really good books to read would be Women Don't Ask, and another one would be Lean In. So Women Don't Ask, the first version, has all of the academic research behind it. And it basically says, it, reiterates what Gigi just said about how women don't ask and how it ends up affecting us throughout our entire careers and ends up affecting our retirement funds and everything else. And then Lean In gives you a lot of solutions as to how to handle situations so that you don't get dinged in the way that women often get dinged simply by being women. I want to bring something very different to the table. And this comes again from my experience. So as I told you, I grew up in Azerbaijan, and um, I came to the United States, I found a job, I was a programmer, and I moved quickly within a couple of years to Pricewaterhouse. One of the best things that happened to me was my boss. He was an exceptional leader, and um, here's an example. We're in a meeting with 
CEOs of top Fortune 50 companies, all males, and myself. I was young at that time. <laughs> and um, we discussed very serious business issues related to deployment of SAP systems and how to distribute business processes and how to integrate all those systems. So there is a lot of discussions, and I have my opinion. What do I do? I take a piece of paper, and I write what I think on that piece of paper, and I push it to my boss. Because I, wasn't, I, I was not comfortable talking loud, me, you know, having that luggage of my upbringing. What my boss does, and I want you to use it as an example in looking at what you do in your everyday life, you, male and female, uh, leaders trying to bring up those young people into leadership and technology and entrepreneurial. Suddenly he stood up and he said, Tatiana has something to say. <laughs> so he put me on the spot. He decided not to take credit for the thoughts that I've written to him. So why don't you, next time you're at the meeting, you give a chance to other people in the room to young people to speak up and try to listen and support them. I went through this. It helped me working with people like them to be on stage and talk about things now. And you can do it, but you need to think about it and actually try to do it and implement it in your day-to-day -day life. We'll start on this side. What are, what are some of the strategies that that, that you feel are different when you're at the helm than normally are if a guy like me is, is at the helm? And, and how, does, how has that affected outcomes? And why you are so passionate and still ass kicking at 60 plus years old? Well, first of all, I mean, follow your passion. I, 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 you know, if, if you find yourself stuck in a situation where it feels wrong, change it or get out. I mean, that's a really necessary strategy. Uh, and then, why does it make a difference to have a woman at the helm? I, I think women have more empathy, and they are also better at iterating, at letting their idea sort of get wings, give wings to their idea, and, and allow it to just, you know, move out and get better and bigger, uh, where some of the men that I've seen, you know, get really stuck on, on the direction that they yes. set out to, and, and, and they're not very change willing. I, you know, generalization is always really hard, but that's, that's what I think. Passion and, and more change willingness and more empathy. Well said. We got about 30 seconds each, ladies, to give your thoughts. So you're gonna have to be quick over there, Gigi, but we're gonna start, okay, we can start down, we can start here. We've got 30 seconds I'll each, then we got a bop. Um, so just to play off what you said with empathy, I think it's really important if you are gonna be leaders in your organizations and you have men or women who are doing what might be called empathy work, a lot of times it is women, HR, operations, stuff like that, that they are treated as equal and as valuable as the software engineers who everybody bows down to. They should be paid as equal. It's just as hard as job and it's just as effective in the long run for your company. Women, we can do it. Don't expect any favors. Be out there, speak up, and get it. Guys, realize you're actually part of this change as well. And to, to sum all of this up, this isn't just talk, there's actually data. This professor at um, MIT Business School, Malone, he came up with this concept called collective IQ. And they did a huge study across 10 years, lots of people, is which groups had the highest IQ, not individual IQ. And what they found out was groups that were very productive and very successful had three characteristics. The people in the group had a high level of empathy for each other. So the people in the group that was successful, people empathized with the other people on the team, understood their talents, understood their shortcomings, and worked with them. 
That was one. Number two was that when those people worked together, there was an equal sharing of people talking. So you found, like, instead of one or two people talking the most and the rest listening, you found that everyone shared their ideas the most. So that was point number two of a successful group. Point number three of a successful group was that those groups had a higher percentage of women, not all women, but actually had a more equal ratio of women than the other groups. So that kind of summarizes the empathy, the speak up, and why you should have women in science and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a round of applause. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much.